Episode 49, The Fall of North African Christianity. Welcome back to A to Z History Presents, The Papacy and Early Church. I'm your host, Steve. It's hard to believe that at one time, Africa was the heartland of Christianity. In particular, Northwest Africa held some of the most important centers of early Christianity, and many of the most influential Christian leaders were from North Africa. We've talked about North Africa in past episodes, but it is worth defining the exact geographical area we'll be discussing in this episode. North Africa is a gigantic area. It stretches from the Atlantic Ocean in the west all the way to the Red Sea in the east. It is bordered to the north by the Mediterranean Sea and the Sahara Desert in the south. These geographic features played a key role in the history of the area. We're going to split North Africa into two pieces for our conversation today, Egypt and the Maghreb. These two regions of North Africa were quite different in antiquity and indeed are distinct to this day. The region of the Maghreb contains the following countries starting in the west and moving east. Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. We'll get into the geography and demography of those places in a bit. Egypt was separated from the rest of North Africa because in antiquity, Egypt was much more influenced by the Greeks than rather than the Latins. The native Copts were also distinct culturally and linguistically from the Berber people of the western part of North Africa. Christianity developed differently in Egypt and along the east coast of Africa than it did in the western part of North Africa. North Africa, Egypt included, was the heartland of Christianity, and in general the lands of the Maghreb were the core of Latin western Christianity. North Africa was arguably the most important and influential area of Latin Christianity up until the 4th-5th centuries. That might have seemed surprising if you look at the demographics of that area today. Based on the CIA World Factbook, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia are 99 plus percent Muslim today, with Libya coming in at about 96 percent Muslim. Libya is unique because of its proximity to Egypt, which still has a small but significant population of Christians. The purpose of this episode is to look at the history of North African Christianity and discuss some of the theories why Christianity almost completely disappeared from that area fairly quickly after the Islamic conquest. A little homework assignment for you is to compare what happened in the Maghreb to other areas of the empire that were conquered and how Christianity fared in those areas. Share your ideas on the website a2zhistorypage.com, Twitter, and Facebook. What you think will definitely show up in future episodes. Before we delve into how Roman North Africa became the heartland of Latin Christianity, we have to see how North Africa became a part of the Roman Empire in the first place. We're all probably fairly familiar with the problems the Roman Republic had with Carthage. These two powers had a number of scrapes which eventually led to Rome conquering Carthage in 146 BC. The rest of North Africa to the Atlantic Ocean came into the empire soon afterwards. The climate of this area was very well suited to grain production. Egypt was famous for supplying grain to Rome and Constantinople, but the Maghreb was equally so, if not more important in the trade of grain and other agricultural commodities than Egypt was. The Romans colonized North Africa, forming a number of major provinces. The names and boundaries depended on the time period— There was Mauritania, which was more or less modern Morocco, and the western part of Algeria. The rest of Algeria was called Numidia. Carthage and Africa Proconsularis will be important for our story today. Then there was the land to the east between Africa Proconsularis and Egypt, which corresponds to modern-day Libya. This area went by a few different names, including Cyrenaica, Tripolitania, and Libya. 
Cyrenaica, or Libya, or whatever you want to call it, was a transitional area between more Latin Western Africa and Greek Egypt. Eventually, the area would be added to the Patriarch of Alexandria's zone of influence, but the Libyans weren't exactly comfortable with that relationship. It took some time for Carthage to rise out of the ruins after it was conquered by Rome, but Carthage would become a wealthy city again. The Romans colonized the Maghreb in a similar way as other parts of the empire. Basically, soldiers were settled, and great land magnates ran plantations that grew all the foodstuffs that fueled the growth of the empire. This section of the empire was incredibly peaceful, for the most part, and for hundreds of years. The military presence was always minimal. The population was predominantly Berber peoples. The Berbers in the more Romanized areas became more Roman than many Romans. In Italy, in the vicinity around Rome, they really embraced everything about the Latin language and culture. Berber peoples who lived nearer to the Sahara or in the hinterlands absorbed Latin culture to lesser degrees than those in the cities. Many important figures such as writers, philosophers, and even a Roman emperor were born in North Africa. These include the playwright Terence, writer Apuleius, and the emperor Septimius Severus. The Christians hit the scene in North Africa the way they did in many other areas and parts of the empire, mostly through the shipping routes of the Mediterranean, although it took a little longer for Christianity to grab hold in the Maghreb. By around the early 100s AD, the community in Carthage was becoming especially important. By the early 200s, the Carthage community was quite strong and influential. You have Christian theologians like Tertullian defining the most fundamental dogmas of the religion. In Carthage, Tertullian developed the idea of God being in three personas. His writing influenced just about every other Christian thinker. Tertullian wrote in Carthage completely in Latin, all the while using classical Roman styles of discourse. Never mind that Tertullian would fall into heresy and be swept under the rug for the most part, his works are still the bedrock Christian theology was built upon. You think Tertullian was the only North African in the game during the late 100s and late 200s? Not by a long shot. Pope Victor was one of a handful of African popes, including Miltiades in the early 300s and Galatius at the end of the 400s. Victor and Galatius were Latin Romans through and through. Galatius was said to be a Roman by birth, even though he was born in, quote, Nacione Afer, which is Africa, and that simply means the vicinity around Carthage. Carthage was an interesting example of how Christianity spread across the Roman world so quickly. Since Christianity came to North Africa a bit later than in some other areas of the Roman Empire, Carthage didn't have a great claim to an apostolic foundation. A disciple of Peter may have founded the Christian community in Carthage. One of the earliest written records of Christians in North Africa is the book The Passion of the Skeleton Martyrs. The Skeleton Martyrs were a group of 12 men and women who were rounded up for not properly paying their due to the emperor. They wouldn't renounce their faith, so they were executed. This book comes from about the year 180 AD and could be the earliest Christian piece of writing in the Latin language. The first pope to write in the Latin language was Victor, and he was North African, and the first Christian text to be written in all Latin, or all in Latin, comes from North Africa, not Italy or the city of Rome. Now let's talk about demographics. The religion of Jesus came to Carthage through the trade routes. A massive amount of trade went through Carthage, and what oftentimes happens with trade, ideas sneak aboard with the cargo. If you've listened to the show for some time, then maybe you remember all the way back to one of the first Sidetrack episodes on this Plague of Cyprian. Sidetrack episode 4, if you want to go back and have another listen. In that episode, we talked about how Christianity grew in Carthage and North Africa. As a 
case study of how Christianity spread. In the book, The Rise of Christianity by Rodney Stark, he lays out a very plausible scenario for how and why Christianity grew so quickly in the 200s AD. There's no real data from this era, so Stark uses mostly guesswork and some textual evidence, but his estimates are rather conservative. Stark supposes that Christianity was growing at about a rate of 40% a year. That might seem really high, but for comparison in our modern times, Mormonism grows at that rate or even a higher rate per year. That 40% number doesn't even budge the demographic numbers when you consider in the late 100s and early 200s, Christians made up maybe 2% of the population. 40% growth is high, but it is a 40% of a very small number. What raised the number of Christians and the percentage of Christians in the larger population was a series of disastrous plagues that hit the Roman Empire. According to Stark, Christians were more apt to care for their fellows who came down with the plague. People who receive some sort of care are more likely to survive a disease than those who receive no care at all. The biggest example of this is the so-called Plague of Cyprian, named after one of the most famous Roman African bishops. This disease was likely a viral disease, possibly smallpox, mumps, or measles. If a person stayed hydrated, nourished, and comfortable, the mortality rate of some of these viral diseases can drop from over 30% to as low as 8%. The survival rate of these diseases, combined with the higher conversion rate, turned Christianity from an insignificant minority in North Africa in the years prior to 250 to a very powerful minority by the end of the century. We're talking about numbers as high as 25% or more of the population. Also, this population was concentrated in the cities, so the percentages locally could have been much higher. In 251, the first empire-wide persecution of Christians occurred. The emperor Decius wanted to ensure every Roman citizen made a sacrifice to the Roman state deities. Sacrificing to pagan deities is severely frowned upon in the Christian religion. Some Christians actually did sacrifice, though, in some way. This made Some of the Christians who didn't sacrifice and were harmed for not sacrificing angry. In Italy, a group formed called the Novationists. This group didn't want to let Christians who sacrificed to be allowed back into the religion at all. Around the year 300, the emperor Diocletian started another major empire-wide persecution. The persecution of Diocletian was much stronger and severe than the Decian persecution, and many, many people lapsed in their faith. Some clergy, when confronted, gave sacred books, vestments, or other significant religious articles to the Roman authorities. Some clergy gave heretical writings to the Romans while telling the Romans the books were actually legitimate. A group would rise up in North Africa, which was very similar to the Novationists, and they're wanting to hold to a puritanical mindset that those who lapsed shouldn't be allowed back in. This North African group was led by a Berber churchman named Donatus Magnus. The followers of Donatus, the Donatists, believed in absolutely no quarter for the lapsed, or as the Donatists called them, the traditores, traitors. The Donatists believed if a priest or bishop lapsed, they could no longer carry out their liturgical functions, and as a consequence that their ordinations, Eucharist, marriages, confessions, and anything else were completely invalid. The hardline almost puritanical stance of the Donatists became very popular in North Africa and even spread to Spain, Gaul, and Italy. One thing to consider is that outwardly, there wasn't a shred of difference between the Catholics and the Donatists. Dogmatically, their faiths were the same. It was over a few pastoral issues that they would separate themselves. The separation was not amicable either. 
the Catholics and the Donatists fought with each other in councils and on the streets for centuries. People hold grudges all the time, but this was a grudge that lasted for generations through good times and bad. We should explore why there was such bad blood between the official Roman Catholic Orthodox Church and the Donatists. The church historian W.H.C. Friend proposes that the differences between the established Catholic Church and the Donatists may have been based on social, cultural, and economic reasons. This socio-economic cultural explanation definitely has some reasonable logic to it, but it also has some weaknesses. What the theory boils down to is that the indigenous, economically disadvantaged Berbers used religious purity as a way to fight against their Roman landlords. The economics of the region were definitely top-heavy. A small number of wealthy landowners controlled the economics of the region, and the economic system of the region was designed to support the city of Rome and the greater empire. Economically, that all makes sense, but the differences between classes and people wasn't as stark in reality. The line between Berber and Roman was completely blurred. Romanized Berbers and Romans who lived in North Africa for tens of generations owned property and had business concerns all over the Mediterranean world. Even the people in the rural areas had strong connections culturally and economically to Rome. Don't forget, by the 300s AD, this area had been part of the Roman Empire for over 450 years. Let's put that amount of time into perspective. Europeans first colonized the Americas about 500 years ago. Just think about the cultural impact European colonization has had on the Americas, and you start to get an idea of how deep the cultural roots of Rome ran in North Africa. A point would come in which the bishopric of Carthage would possess nearly as much power as the Pope of Rome. North Africa, centered on Carthage, was the epicenter of Western Latin Christian thought. The powerful church leader Cyprian was the bishop of Carthage. Cyprian easily could have wrested a great deal of power from the bishop of Rome, but in the end he respected the unique position of Rome. I have wondered why Carthage wasn't ranked higher in the church hierarchy. Politically speaking, Carthage was at least or close to other cities like Antioch in power and influence. Although Carthage did have a few things working against it. For one, its apostolic founding was weak. Alexandria, Rome, Antioch, and especially Jerusalem had rock-solid foundations by top apostles or followers of Jesus. At the end, the lack of a connection to those earliest Christian fathers and Christian leaders was what stopped Carthage from gaining status as a patriarchate. The church writer Lactantius was North African. Although Pelagius wasn't born in North Africa, both Pelagius and his main disciples spent a significant part of their careers there and did a great number of their writings from there. Councils were called against them there. So that's a huge connection. And then arguably the biggest name of them all was Augustine of Hippo. Augustine is a doctor of the Western Church and one of, or maybe the, most important theologians of the Western Church. Every Western theologian up to this day had to make their ideas work with Augustine. That is how important he is. Augustine was such a prolific writer, it's ridiculous, just thousands of pages of work. Isidore of Seville, another great character I can't wait to talk about, who lived in the late 500s, early 600s, Spain said, quote, Anyone who claims to have read all of Augustine is a liar. That is how much Augustine wrote. A less fun explanation to that quote is that Isidore was making a statement of how difficult it was to obtain reading materials in late antiquity. I personally like the first explanation. Augustine was bishop of a large city in Numidia, modern-day eastern Algeria, called Hippo Regius. 
In the 430s AD, the Roman world was falling apart at the seams. Augustine's own city of Hippo was under siege by the Vandals and would fall to them shortly after Augustine's death. In the late 300s, groups or tribes of Germanic people started to migrate from their ancestral lands and other parts of Europe and eventually into the Roman Empire. We won't get into all of the reasons. If you want to learn more, you can always check in with the History of Germany podcast by Travis Dow, and he'll fill you in on the details. Right now, though, all we need to know is that these Germans were on the move. These Germanic tribes were not nomadic. As Travis mentioned during our crossover episode, Sidetrack episode 28, for your reference. Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Vandals, Franks, and even Alans, who weren't technically Germanic, but whatever, all came and entered the empire during this period. The shocking thing is how quickly everything started to fall apart for the Roman Empire. At the time of the Council of Constantinople in 381, the empire was in a pretty stable position. As we get into the early 400s, things quickly take a nosedive. Rome was sacked in 410 by the Visigoths. The Vandals moved into Spain in the early 400s, setting up a small fiefdom. The Vandals had conquered slash absorbed another migratory group called the Alans. The Vandals even gave their name to the area of Spain they settled in, which, filtered through Arabic and back again through Spanish, gives us the modern name for the area, Andalusia or Andalusia, from Wandalusia, from the name the Vandals gave the area, Wandalusia. The Visigoths, after sacking Rome, spread through Gaul, but were pushed out by the Franks into Spain. Upon settling in Spain, the Visigoths pushed the Vandals' Allen alliance out into North Africa. The Vandals fought their way through North Africa. They conquered Hippo Regius in 432, which gave them control of Numidia. The Romans were fairly well terrified at this point because they were losing their breadbasket. A couple of battles were fought that did not end well for the Romans. Then, in 439... Africa, Proconsularis, and Carthage fell to the Vandal king Genseric. The Vandals, like many of their Germanic brethren, were Aryan Christians, subordinationists we also call them, not Catholic Orthodox. Most of the Germans didn't make a huge deal about this doctrinal difference. They were in the Roman Empire for economic reasons, not to spread the Aryan position or otherwise rehash all those issues. The majority of Aryan Goths were happy to let the Catholic Orthodox Romans keep on with what they were doing, with maybe a little mild persecution here and there. Not so for the Vandals. They very much persecuted the Catholics and the Donatists in the vicinity of Carthage. Not so for the Vandals. They very much persecuted the Catholics and the Donatists in the vicinity of Carthage. Here we see phase two of the destabilization of Christianity in North Africa. Donatism caused a major rift, and now you have a major persecution by Vandal Arians. As we said, many of the wealthy people held estates in Italy or Sicily and other areas, so they just booked it when the Vandals came. Other places in the empire had a magnate class and strong Catholic bishops to bolster the Christian Roman population. That wasn't the case in North Africa. The Vandals persecuted the bishops, and the magnates headed to greener, at least slightly greener, pastures, leaving little leadership for the local Roman population. Add in the general population decline that was going on, and you have a severely weakened situation economically, militarily, and religiously, as far as Christianity went, at least. The Vandal kingdom lasted for a little short of 100 years. The kingdom was marked by relative strength and stability. The territories the Vandals controlled was much less than Roman North Africa, classical Roman North Africa. Their power base was centered in Carthage in Africa Proconsularis, along with a small coastal patch of Numidia, Sicily, 
a bit of Libya, and the major western Mediterranean islands of Corsica, Sardinia, and the Balearic Islands. Again, the relative strength and stability of the Vandal Kingdom came from a few sources. For one, they held a strategic territory for trade. Secondly, the Vandals had a smooth succession of leadership. Their first king in Africa, the previously mentioned Genseric, lived for a long time. He didn't die until 477 AD. Genseric and his successors really put the screws to the Orthodox Catholic population of Carthage and the surrounding areas. The Donatists, who were predominantly Berber and focused more around Numidia, were able to just slide over geographically and for the most part stay out of the Vandals' way. The Orthodox Romans, or Catholics, or whatever you prefer to call them, were in a tougher position. The ones who could leave did. The Orthodox who stayed faced constant persecution. They were in effect squeezed out of Vandal territory. The emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire made a big deal about the persecution, but the kings of the Vandals were like, What's the big deal? We're just doing the same persecution strategies you Eastern Romans used against our brother Arians in your empire. The Vandals even proposed that if the Eastern Romans stopped persecuting Arians in the empire, the Vandals would stop persecuting Orthodox in their kingdom. The Eastern Romans just left that deal alone on the table. They had no intention of stopping their persecution programs. And really, the Vandals weren't either. By the end of the Vandal era, Orthodox Catholic Christianity was almost completely replaced by Arianism in the area around Carthage, the heart of North Africa. The next phase of the story starts with Justinian and Belisarius and the Eastern Roman conquest or reacquisition of North Africa. With some luck, world-class generalship, and a dose of moxie, Belisarius was able to take over Carthage and a good chunk of the rest of North Africa in 533 AD. The Eastern Romans had a rocky time running North Africa. They tried to reintroduce Orthodox Catholic Christianity, but it just wasn't very successful. The Donatist revived too. So it just really wasn't a stable situation in North Africa at all. The land had gone through so much change politically and religiously, the area was just terribly weakened after so many years of upheaval. So now enters the Arabs, the armies of Islam. The Arabs seem to have just about come out of nowhere at the perfect time in history. They had a system or a cultural organization that was perfectly adapted to exploit the weaknesses that surrounded them. Throughout the 600s AD, the Arabs spread through Egypt and into western Libya. As they progressed, the Arabs would set up bases they could use to support further operations. When they conquered more, they set up more bases to support more conquests. By 709 AD, All of North Africa, from the Sinai to Tingis in the west, was all completely under the control of the Arabs. That is a stretch of territory nearly 2,500 miles long, conquered in less than 60 years. After the Arabs conquered North Africa, they moved into southern Europe. I want so badly to discuss the Arab conquest of Spain, but I have to put that off for today. In the hopefully not too distant future, I plan to create an entire series on medieval Spain. If that's something you'd like to hear, contact me and let me know what you think. So what happened after the Arabs had final and firm control over North Africa, you might be asking yourself? How did the Arabs so quickly stamp out Christianity from this area where Christian roots seemingly ran so deep? Christianity wasn't stamped out by the Arabs. That wasn't in their game plan at this time. In some areas of the Maghreb, such as Numidia, Christianity survived well into the 1000s or even later. Although they were tiny communities, they did have Orthodox Catholic bishops, and even a few of their inscriptions have survived. It is important to note, these surviving traces of Christianity were Trinitarian and not Arian. There is no clear-cut theory of why Christianity completely vanished from the Maghreb when, for the most part, 
Christianity survived and even in some cases thrived in Muslim-held areas. We have some case studies for what happened during the, the Arab conquests around the same time as the conquest of North Africa and the two areas that bookended the Maghreb geographically. These two areas provide a contrast to what happened in the Maghreb. Spain sits to the north of the Maghreb and Egypt to the east. Both Spain and Egypt remained Christian, strongly so for hundreds of years after the Arab conquest. Spain and Egypt were culturally quite different at that time, but there was one thing these two areas held in common that separated them from the Maghreb. Both Spain and Egypt were firmly Trinitarian, while the heart of North Africa, Carthage and Africa Proconsularis, were Arian. Spain held to the Trinitarian formulation of the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, which said Jesus was fully God and fully human. The Egyptians held to the Trinitarian formulation rejected at Chalcedon that said Jesus was fully God and fully human, but his divinity overshadowed his humanity. I imagine that last sentence sounded a bit strange, but don't worry. We'll get into the natures of Jesus soon. Another factor working against the Trinitarians of the Maghreb was the absence of a strong monastic movement. Monks didn't play around with their faith and didn't easily jump ship when times got tough. We see that in Egypt and northwestern Europe. The monastic communities acted as an anchor for the local populations. Monks and monastic communities would play a very powerful role in the spread of Christianity. Compare that with the North Africans who held Aryan beliefs, which were rejected way back in Nicaea 325. To the Aryans, Jesus was a great prophet and a perfect man, but God the Father was unitary and all-powerful. Doesn't that sound just at least a hint like the new landlords who had just conquered their territory's faith? The Muslims held religious views that were really incredibly similar to the Aryans. For Trinitarians to accept Islam, they had to completely reject the indisputable core tenet of their faith, that Jesus was God. The Arians didn't have to do that. Robin Pearson of the History of Byzantium podcast did a number of great episodes on the foundation of early Islam. The very earliest followers of Islam in Arabia lived in close contact with subordinationist Christians in the Middle East. Some of Islam's earliest documents very well may have been influenced by subordinationist Middle Eastern Christianity. The Aryans of North Africa found more in common with the Arabs and Islam than they did with the Eastern Romans or other Trinitarian Christians. The views of Islam on Jesus were so close it would have been natural for the Arians to join in with the winning team rather than fight them. The Arians were really just carrying on their faith with a few modifications on the margin. They didn't have to reject any of their core beliefs to become followers of Islam. In fact, Islam may have enhanced their faith. In places where Trinitarian Christianity was strong, like Donatist Numidia or even up in Spain, Islam had a more difficult time gaining converts. But like we said, at this point in history, gaining converts wasn't, wasn't a part of Islam's strategy. At the end of the day, Christianity wasn't stamped out of North Africa, but instead a slow process of demographics, politics, and a unique set of historical events led to Christianity withering on the vine. The heartland of Western Latin Christianity would move north into northwestern Europe, France, Spain, Italy. Many wars would be fought over religion and populations would be forced to convert from one faith to the next and back again. We are going to continue to dig deep in the long lost and forgotten periods of Christianity in our next series. I'm excited to start our next adventure, so I hope you'll join us. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode on Latin North African Christianity. I'd like to thank listener Michelle for her kind and generous donation. Don't forget to go over to a2zhistorypage.com to subscribe and find out more about the show. One last thing, the RSS feed for the show has changed, and you can find that on the website 
by clicking on the subscribe to RSS feed. And if you want any more information on that, you can always email me at steve at a2zhistorypage.com. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you on our next stop on our trip through the history of the Roman popes and Christian church.